Hello, my name is Vlado Damianovsky. I am the founder of VD Labs. In this short video, I will introduce you to the latest version 2 of my app called VD Labs Calculator. The VD Labs Calculator is written both for the iOS and Android operating systems, which means you can find it on the Apple's App Store as well as on the Google's Play Store. Just search under the name VD Labs Calc. I should remind the potential users that you can also use the iOS version of the app on the latest Mac M1 based computers, while the Android version can also be run on a standard Mac or PC by installing Android emulation software. This app is intended for all who use digital cameras, be that a cinematographer, photographer, machine vision user or certainly surveillance or CCTV user. The primary goal is to help determine focal length for a given angle of view or perhaps distance for a given pixel density, which defines the recognizability of the objects observed, and thus you can make sure that your installation complies with the latest standards. The VideoLabs calculator also allows you to find the optimum exposure in order to minimize the motion blur effect when observing a moving objects such as a running person or a moving vehicle with a certain speed. Since everything of interest in surveillance moves, using these calculations can be extremely useful, whether that is a LPR, license plate recognition system, or perhaps face recognition software. Even intelligent AI algorithms can benefit from using our app calculations for optimum object clarity. The VideoLabs calculator can also help you in determining the required hard disk storage for a given days of recording, or perhaps tell you what size of a USB flash drive you need in order to export 10 minutes of video, for example, of all your cameras involved in recording an incident in your CCTV system so that you can pass this to the authority for further investigation. Last but not least, we also show you the simulated quality of the selected compression in your system by using our VideoLabs test chart. There are many more applications where you can use this calculator, as it can be applied to any type of camera with any size of imaging sensor available. While in the original version 1, we had the choice of all commercially available sensors by way of scrolling windows, in the version 2, we allowed users to enter any size of sensor or pixel dimensions, even if they are not in the database. Manual entries are now available for all other parameters too. There are separate study case videos on our website, which will give you a better idea how you can use the VideoLabs calculator, so make sure you check them out too. So, let me first introduce you to the concept of the VideoLabs calculator application. Okay, so here we are. We've got two different smartphones. One is Android based, the other is iOS. And I will explain both work obviously the same. So I will use the iOS to show you because I'm connected uh, with a USB cable to my iOS. So I can show you what it looks like. So I think you can see me reasonably well. So uh, bottom right hand corner, that's the icon for VidLabs calculator. That's how you will recognize it in the App Store or in the uh, Google Play Store. So if we open that one up. Um, <clears throat> this is the first so-called visual screen of the application. And before we go any further, I'll just show you that if you click on the menu, touch the menu, there is also digital application, which I will explain for calculating the storage. And if you click back again to the menu, you can also save presets, so any calculations that you have, uh, that you have made for whatever sensor you want or whatever duration of recording you want uh, for any number of camera, you can save it there, give it a name, and then you can always recall it quickly. And obviously you will have also uh, a little disclaimer about. But let's see first the visual screen application. As you can see, a number of different colors which may initially uh, look confusing, but it's very simple logic, and this is the purpose of this. So if you're using this application for the first time, what you have to know is that the blue uh, bottom part, blue squares, 
is the first thing you need to enter which actually depend on your cameras that you're using so really the only thing you need to find out from the manufacturer of the camera that you have what is the image sensor that you have and you need to know what is the pixel count you have on that sensor basically that's all that you need to know to start from uh, because there are so many different sensors so by scrolling this you can see all commercially available sensors are lo uh, loaded into database and you by scrolling you can go to any size including let's say photographers full frame which is 36 mil by 24 for example that's let's say fx full frame is usually called fx up to the largest one that you can uh, find by searching with scrolling is the medium uh, digital format called medium L but you can also change this to any size you want by uh, double clicking if you double click you are now entering any size sensor you want for example my new sensor is 100 millimeter wide and let's say the vertical double click I know it's probably let's say 60 millimeter wide so you're entering any size of sensor you, you have. If you scroll it, it goes back to whatever is in the database. Second is you need to know what resolution is your camera. Uh, this is by default HD, 1920 by 1080, but obviously you can enter anything you want here. And again, in the version one, you could only choose from the scrolling dimensions, which are reasonably standard pixel count. But now by double clicking there, you can enter any pixel dimension you want. For example, I want to enter 8000 pixels horizontal and I want to enter double click, uh, let's say 4000 pixels vertical. So this is the starting point. And let's say you choose whatever you want. And that's basically you don't change since you uh, we are assuming or the system assumes you know what camera sensor you're using. Once you know that everything else is calculated as you saw all these numbers scrolling. So let's go back to a normal uh, known, let's say 4K uh, resolution which can be found by scrolling let's say this is a 4K and for example the next thing you do is um, you see this yellow uh, uh, red uh, outlined squares you can't change them because they are locked and they are locked because for example I have a camera with 8.75 mm lens and when I want to find out at what distance this camera that has got full frame sensor 36 by 24 mil in our case example uh, and uses let's say 4k uh, resolution that that has that many pixels um, and I want for example to find out uh, at what distance I will have face identification according to the standards now face identification if you click on the face identification comes up with a 350 pixels per meter this is the face identification that we recommend as amended by the Australian standards uh, to the IEC defined 62676-4 standards from 2014, I think, or 15. We corrected it, even though the standards calls for 250, which we can use if you want to, of course. Uh, we are saying by default, we entered the presets, these six buttons on the right, to be actually what we know will give you the best results. So uh, whether you use it manually or even by double tapping and entering, let's say, 350 or by scrolling, either way, you see that the actual distance to scene um, window came up with a distance of 2.67 meters, right? So that means uh, in this case, we have found out for the full frame sensor with 4K resolution that we have, according to the standards, 350 pixels per meter density which means clarity of the image with the 8.75 mil at 2.67 meters now if i know uh, i can go the other way so let's say i know that my camera and let's say, let's use now uh, a realistic example let's go cctv camera let's say uh, typical would be let's say half inch sensor let's say 380 4k is still okay for this because that's also uh, typical and uh, these days you can find half inch sensors with 4k resolution let's say and you can see actually the calculator immediately came with with a 15 meters distance for 350 pixels per meter right but now let's say you you are thinking i am asked 
to install this camera at 10 meters distance. So basically what you do, you either scroll it down to 10 meters or you double click again and you can enter, let's say, uh, I know it's a 10 meter distance. So now if you don't want to change this, you hold one second with the finger and see that goes red. Red means now it's locked. So now you basically can't change the distance because you actually locked it since you know this is the distance you need to install the camera. And now, as you can see, we are having pixel density of 525. Now, my requirement perhaps in this installation is to have face identification again. So let's touch that button face identification. That calculates the focal length of 5.83 mil or let's say 6 mil. So with a half inch sensor that has 3840 by 2160 pixels, which is 4K, for me to be able to obtain face identification at 10 meters distance, I need to use like at least six millimeter lens. And that's as simple as that. Now you will see that in the same time, at the same time when calculating focal length and distances, always horizontal angle of view, and vertical angle of view is calculated. And it's also the scene width and scene height for the pixel aspect ratio that you have. So you can actually go the opposite way. For example, you may say, my installation requires to have to cover the front entry of a let's say hall where there are four doors next to each other and each of these doors is let's say two meters wide so for example uh, i want to see as much as possible with the four doors at two meters width what is the distance uh, the width that i i need to see in that case four times two would be eight so on the scene width we actually can either scroll down to eight meters or we can enter it manually let's enter it by scrolling that calculator now tells us uh, if you want to cover the eight meters width which is with the f the four doors of two meters uh, wide each uh, you need eight millimeter lens and that will cover definitely the whole width as, as requested. In that case, the calculator says you will actually obtain 480 pixel density with that lens at 10 meters distance. So that means I, can, I will have now much higher clarity because the pixel density is 480, much higher than 250 or 350, which is required by the standards. So that's basically how you change this part. So anything is interchangeable. You can go from the scene width to find the focal length, or you can go from the focal length to find the distance for certain pixel density. You can go whichever way you want. And we will see later on with some practical examples. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, applications you can, you can do that. And you will see how easy it is to use it in almost any uh, system design. Now, the uh, actual uh, top three gray windows in, on this screen, sensor blur angle motion velocity that you see there. If you hold that for a second or more, that opens up. And now you've got the opportunity to calculate how many pixels blurriness you will produce by a moving object in front of the camera. So for example, if we have, let's say, symbolically background of this application we always had this uh, drawing which shows uh, bicycles basically going with certain speed so let's for the sake of the uh, completeness have bicycle uh, passing by let's say with 30 kilometers an hour right so if we enter here either by scrolling or even quicker or better by double clicking again we enter let's say 30 kilometers an hour and we use so you follow now the colors uh, of the windows you can see that the bottom uh, right hand corner we also have green which is associated with this with this screen so in other words as you can see yellows are kind of all uh, interconnected uh, orange is uh, obviously a, a little bit different because it's a distance but as soon as i change this the orange ones are connected in a way but the green ones are different because we are calculating now the motion velocity for the given sensor for the given uh, pixel density for the given focal length and distance because motion velocity blurriness uh, a blurriness from object moving with certain speed depends on all these factors which is why it is a little bit unique the way how we calculate and I believe this is the only application in the world that does this. So if we assume that the bicycles are going with 30 kilometers an hour perpendicularly to the optical axis and perpendicular means this is the 90 degree angle of view 
as signified here with this drawing and we'll see how more practical usage is if you know this angle to be different than 90 degrees we can calculate almost any uh, object with any speed so typically default real-time streaming of a camera is 125th to produce 25 pictures a second of course uh, we can shorten this uh, most cameras allow you to shorten the electronic exposure by way of manually uh, adjusting in the camera menu so what that means is if we don't do anything if we take the camera as it comes from the factory chances are it will be set to 125th of a second and that produces in our case 160 pixels of blurriness now that is quite high which means a motion uh, object in this case bicycle going at 10 meters passing at 10 meters away using 8 millimeter focal length lens on this sensor will have 160 pixel blurriness which means you will hardly even recognize if there are people there with certain features whether they are wearing a jumper with stripes or not chances are with 160 pixels you will see nothing but blurry uh, blurry objects so what what you need to do or what you would like to calculate is what exposure should i use in order to minimize the sense of blur to no more than 10 pixel blurriness that will appear to you reasonably sharp to recognize what it is so basically what you need to do is we need to shorten the exposure and as you can see as you're shortening the exposure sensor blurriness gets lower and lower in pixels and in our case let's find a way i mean obviously you can enter manually so if i double tap there instead of 250 let's put there 500 okay so it gives me eight pixels blurriness right so that means if i now set my camera to have electronic exposure or not be longer than one five hundredth of a second which is 0 0.02 of a second then i will have blurriness which is only eight pixels which i think will be uh, reasonably uh, sufficient for you to recognize who that is of course ideally you would need to have this sensor blur to be one or two but that's really uh, not easily done because as you're shortening the exposure we all know you basically are allowing less light in the um, in the sensor so obviously you want to find the compromise where you've got sufficient light and short exposure enough to actually minimize this blurriness and that can be done on almost any cctv camera uh, of course if you want to use special applications like license plate recognition over there people typically use strobe lights whether that is visible light or infrared light in order to produce sufficient light so that you can shorten the exposure to whatever the calculation tells you to do so that is the basis of why uh, and how you calculate this motion uh, sensor blur now angle is changed simply uh, because when you have a vehicle let's say a car passing perpendicularly in front of the camera of course you won't be able to recognize number plates so there is no point in a way uh, unless uh, you have other uh, application but typically for vehicles passing in front of a camera you typically would have an angle that is reasonably small I always use an example of let's say about 30 degrees although you can use any uh, really angle so 30 degrees now calculates because of the angles relative to the optical axis that angle we call here uh, delta basically now you can see that in that case the the blurriness will not appear as strong as when something goes perpendicularly so we can actually now extend the exposure instead of one five hundredth of a second we can go maybe one two fiftieth of a second which will allow for a little bit less light to produce this image so as you can appreciate this could be very useful in you determining the electronic exposure limit which you can set in the camera settings itself to allow you the best possible picture you can have for the application you you want to achieve and that's what it is so this is the first part of the uh, videolabs calculator the visual part which calculates all these things we can obviously convert easily into fit by just tapping on the fit uh, so clearly it is pixel density will be pixels per feet also speed will be miles per hour instead of kilometers per hour as you can see here pixels per feet miles per hour feet instead of meters you can as i said save it so if i click on the save button here i can give it a name uh, let's say 
my calculation the test calculation let's say test one and this could be used simply in in a project where you can go and do the calculation for every single camera that belongs to a system so that you can have screenshots and then you can submit that with your let's say as installed system drawing i find it also uh, very useful if you save the default settings in case you want to go back to what it is so i've saved here as visual defaults and you will see that goes back to what we had at the very beginning uh, sensor of 4.8 by 3.6 HD resolution and so forth so there you go this is the actual menu and if you want I didn't mention that but if you want to find more if you click on the Videolabs logo here you will go to our website where you can see the examples under the Videolabs app uh, which will be under the app and that I can actually uh, give you some more details once we get to that point and also another thing is if you forget this video under the help we also have a video labs uh, web page that comes up with the actual drawing that explains how the system will be operated now if i press on the menu i'll show you the digital part digital part logic is the same all you need to enter is any of these blue windows and the uh, required hard disk capacity will be calculated for you so as you can see at the top left hand corner we now have so we've got days and now we added in this version minutes as well minutes is used for when you need to have a usb flash disk to export a particular short footage 5 10 15 20 30 minutes whatever so you don't need to worry about uh, large storage but only the minutes so let's do an example for the days and in this case we've got basically any size of camera system you want let's say we'll enter here for example 126 cameras let's say we have a resolution of maybe six megabits per second so this means whether that is h264 or h265 it doesn't matter because megabits per second are megabits per second now from knowledge from experience a rough rule of thumb is whatever the quality you get with H.264 the H.265 will give you the same quality with half of that stream so for example if I'm happy with H.264 at 6 megabits per second then with 3 megabits per second I should be happy with H.265 let's for the purpose of ex exercise or uh, demonstration use 6 megabits per second in this case let's say we want to have perhaps 31 days of recording okay so the calculation is very simple tells me at the bottom left hand corner that the total storage for 126 cameras each one using 6 megabits per second and continuous recording which means i'm not setting any motion estimate which you can of course if you want i'm recording permanently which means 100 percent motion estimate the complete the total storage required is 241 terabytes now what is calculated here at the very bottom sort of brownish windows this is now if i want to install uh, drives that are let's say of 10 terabytes capacity then if i just put them in a just bunch of disk box without any redundancy without raid then uh, i will need 25 uh, of this disk as you can see 25 times 10 is 250 so that means this will be sufficient However, if I want to record in RAID 5 mode, where any of the drives can fail uh, and I won't lose recording, then the calculation says you will need 26, 26 these disks to achieve this recording and have redundancy of any one disk failing. Similarly, if you want to have RAID 6, which is any two drives can concurrently fail and you are not supposed to lose recording you only 27 of this drive so that's the purpose of this bottom part which may not you may not use raid uh, at all but in that case will be just just bunch of disks you can enter up to 20 uh, terabytes uh, because we are today having even 18 terabytes in one physical drive three and a half inch but i think you can enter more than that let's say we can enter 50 terabytes as you can see tomorrow if there are bigger drives you can still calculate 
with this calculation. Now, another important thing that we brought in here, we've got now our Wittler test chart, I should say, that actually gives us simulation of the test chart appearance for the 6 megabits per second streaming or compression. So as you can see, 6 megabits looks pretty, pretty cool, pretty smooth, which is the purpose of having large megabits per second. And what happens if, for example, I want to save on hard drive space because I don't have 240 or 50 terabytes. So what we can do is if we reduce now the compression stream, let's say we drop it down to perhaps one megabits per second. OK, now see what happens with the quality of the this is a simulated, however, very close to what it is because we've produced them with actual one megabit per second recording at H264. This is how bad it will look if I choose one megabit per second. Some customers may be quite happy with, with overall appearance, in which case this is sufficient. But as you can see, the, the, stepper, the stepping JPEG artifacts and quantization artifacts are quite obvious, which means, well, maybe one megabit per second, even though I only need 40 terabytes in that case. So it's quite big saving on capacity, which means on costing you may be uh, actually trying to find a little bit better than that. Let's say 2 megabits per second. That looks slightly better. At least the faces are not with that many artifacts. But now maybe that's still too much. Let's go to 4. And I think 4 megabits per second for H.264 is reasonably good for most of the compressors, compression chips. Although if you are doing with H.265, just imagine this half. So the simulation we've got at this stage is only for H.264, made based on H.264 compression. But uh, rough rule of thumb is uh, using H.265, you, you need half. So that means that will be equivalent to 2 megabits per second with H.265. OK. And finally, uh, the last bit is the image compression. So video compressions are, as some of you would know from maybe my trainings or my books or obviously general knowledge video compressions are three dimensional compressions where time is considered and this is most of the uh, high efficiency recordings on in cctv however some people may choose to record with image compression and if you want to find out what that would be you need to hold one second again this window middle window so suddenly now we've got we have to now know what is the average frame size of the uh, such image compression, let's say typically JPEG, but it could be JPEG 2000, which is actually like wavelet compression of still image. So this image compression does not consider time, which means each image frame is independent. And because of that, they are much bulkier and produce bigger capacity requirement than video compression, which is the reason why people prefer video compression, but in case your system is only using image compression, this is the place where you can enter. You first need to enter, double click, uh, let's say average frame size, average image, which you can easily find from recording a uh, couple of cameras and then take out a couple of them and see. Typically, I would say for the HD, uh, for the high definition 1920 by 1080, an average image size could be 200 kilobytes, let's say, 300, let's say 200. OK, now you also need to know how many frames per second you've got. Typically, a real time streaming requires 25 frames per second. So let's enter that. But you can enter anything in between. So we enter 25. And as you can see here, we've got in this instance for 200 kilobytes for the same amount of days. Remember, we had before 241 terabytes. Now here we've got 1571 terabytes. As you can appreciate, that's a big difference for the similar quality. But in any case, you can you can calculate it that way. So let's go back now to required minutes. So in the under minutes, let's choose now minutes. So this is minutes recording. Let's say we've got to export a footage of 15 minutes of all these 126 cameras that were recorded with image compression. In this case, I would need four, 540 gigabytes. So that's really quite large. What if I was using video compression? So hold that one for a second. I only need 55 gigabytes, and that's really manageable. 64 gigabyte flash drive is easy to find and cheap these days. So 15 minutes recording of 
126 cameras, all of them at 4 megabits per second, will not require more than 55 gigabytes. And for that reason, because this is for USB flash, there is no indication at the bottom part of uh, RAID configuration because you will not have RAID configuration. If I switch now to days, then you've got for the 15 days recording the equivalent required capacity of about 78 terabytes. There you go. And um, I will post videos. By the time you see this, there will be videos showing different examples. And I encourage you to see them because there are so many different applications you can imagine. However, this is, I think, sufficient for you to start using it productively. And any uh, comments or suggestions or questions are more than welcome. My email is vlado at videolabs.com. Please send me uh, anything you want to know further and enjoy the app. And hopefully it is profitable and useful as much as I thought it will be for everybody in our industry. Thank you and see you later.